Let's open with a word of prayer and we'll get right in the word of God this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you. We thank you that the word of God is life and health and healing to all of our flesh this morning. We thank you that your word goes forth and it doesn't come back void, but it does accomplish in which it was sent out to do and prospers in the thing it's been sent. And so this morning, Father, we thank you that the word is alive. It's rich. It's health and healing. And so as we speak your word, we thank you that lives will be changed and hearts will be touched this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, in case you don't know where you're at, as we close the, the, the doors to the aircraft, you are at His Grace Church. I always love that announcement. If you're not going to such and, pl- such, and such a place, you are on, on the wrong airplane. But we've already closed the door, so enjoy the ride. <laughs> this morning, I think we're going to finish up our Hall of Fame. Over the last 10 lessons, we have been, nine lessons we've been looking at, God's Hall of Fame, and we found that we can be part of that Hall of Fame, that that, that particular um, designation of being in His Hall of Fame has not ended, didn't end with the Old Testament saints, and it's, we are still, it's still being written today. You know, we have inductees into the Hall of Fame, the, the, the National Hall of Rock and Roll Fame, the Football League, the Baseball League. All these have annual inductees because of their accomplishments to outstanding greatness within their field of expertise of that sport. You have a field of expertise in God called faith. And as you live your your life in that realm, some would consider it unrealistic, but it is the reality that God's realm is real in your life. And you access it through faith. Faith is the substructure of the things we hope for. It is the evidence of things that we do not see. So we can access the realm of God in our life daily through faith, trust. And so when we talk about faith and we talk about being inducted into the hall of faith, what's that going to require? That's going to require you living according to the rules and regulations that God has laid out for faith. And one of the rules or regulations, the law of faith, is that we have to take God's word as truth. If he spoke it, he said it, he'll do it. Numbers, and I think it's in the 11th verse, says, I'm a God that cannot lie, or 11th chapter, I'm a God that cannot lie. Did I not say it? And will I not do it? So God is a God, that's Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? What we have found through our series is that the men and women that have gone before us that God gave them a word, a promise, that they, they trusted him as faithful. They, they, they believed him to be faithful to his word. They understood that he, was, that, he, that he could not lie. Did you know that that's not even God's nature? God's nature, he can't, he can't even lie. John chapter 14 and verse 6 says, Jesus says this. He said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. There is no lie or untruth in God. Now, when we talk about a lie, what is a lie? Have you ever wondered what a lie is? A lie is just basically a false statement made with deliberate intent to deceive. In, uh, uh, to, to deceive. It's also in, in, in intentional untruth. God doesn't provide intentional untruths in your life to deceive you into believing something that's not true. So, it's a way, a lie is a way to deceive. It's to delude, to dupe, to fool, to cheat, to trick, 
or to take in. And it is something intended or serving to convey a false impression, imposter, sham, or pretense. So when we say God is not a God that cannot, that cannot lie, he's not a God that's going to dupe you, fool you, cheat you, trick you, to take you in. He's going to lead you in by the Holy Ghost. He's going to lead you in through the Word of God. His Word is truth. His Word, he, <coughs> excuse me, He swore by His Word to uphold. There was no greater that He could swear by, so He swore by Him own self within the covenant of Abraham. So, God's not trying to convey a false impression, an imposter or a sham or pretense to get you to walk with Him. His promises are yes and amen. amen. And so when we look at the saints and of old, again, we find that they had a word from God. They had a promise that they just, they, they got a hold of it like a dog without on a bone and wouldn't let it go, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and this is what Hebrews uh, chapter 11 excuse me, is all about. It's all about God's hall of fame. Those that have done great feats in God through just simply believing and trusting His promise, His word. And so, they were ordinary people that did extraordinary things. Are you ordinary? Yep. Yep. I'm ordinarily ordinary every day. But I can do extraordinary things in the realm of God that can create in the temporal realm manifestations of His presence, of His glory, of His power. God doesn't call us to trust and believe Him so that we can just flippantly declare these things that his word says, but never really believe them. We need to get his word on the inside of us. And so each of the members that we looked at in God's hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11 received a word from God, obeyed what he said, and then changed their generation. So notice there was a process. They received a word or a promise from God. Next, they obeyed what God told them to do. And because they obeyed, they changed their generation. You can change your generation through obedience to the promises of God, which are yes and amen. You may have a personal word from the Lord, but if you don't have a personal word from the Lord, you can begin to declare His word, His written word, the rhema word of God, which becomes alive. The word of God is broken down into basically logos and rhema. And I like, I like Logos is the written word. So you have your Bible. It's written. But there comes a place where it becomes what the, the Greek is rhema. It becomes alive. It becomes active to you. It's moving. It's energizing. And so as you declare God's word and you speak God's word, it'll go from seeming like it's not doing anything to there's a spark of faith. And then there's an ignition point, And then it becomes active. And so you can change your generation just like the saints of old did theirs. And this is what will happen to you if you will hear and receive God's word and do what he says. If you'll do what he says, you'll end up in God's ever-expanding hall of fame as well. Isn't that amazing? Faith takes obedience to the to the word of God to a new level because it becomes real to you. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at, along with the Old Testament heroes of faith that we've already looked at, there are New Testament heroes mentioned in God's hall of fame or hall of faith as well. And so what we'll find out is they endured mockings, scourgings, imprisonments, and we're made to wander in deserts and mountains. Woohoo! Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Because when we talk about the spiritual, when we talk about the things of God, when we talk about 
faith. We never look at the unsung heroes of faith. We never look at this part of faith. And through every form of suffering imaginable, these believers obtained a good report and opened the way of faith for us today. When they could run, they stood still. And so, in a final review of our anchor verses, we're going to find again that faith is standing by the things hoped for. So far, we've looked at the elders of the Old Testament and heard the writer of Hebrews talk about the prophets, the kings, and common people who had received a word from God and stood by it until it came to pass. Are you standing by the word that God gave you? Or have you kind of just kind of like, mm, hopefully it'll come to pass. Are you tenaciously declaring what God has spoken to your heart? Or are you just waiting for God to make it happen for you? God's already spoken it. Now you need to get hooked up with God and speak what he's speaking. Quit speaking things that he didn't give you and quit speaking things that are contrary to his word. Begin speaking what he said. Some of you have personal insight. Some of you, the Holy Ghost has put things on the inside of you. Some things that God has spoken to you about your future. And you wonder in your own mind, is that really you, God? Is that really you? It is him. Begin to declare it. Now, if, it, if it's not, after a while, you, you'll know on your inside. But there's things that are on your inside that God's put there that are just sitting there unused, untapped, because you haven't stepped out in faith and began to declare what he said over you. And so you're not seeing the results. Whether on your job or in the ministry, you're not seeing the results that are necessary to promote the development and growth of faith because hope is becoming deferred. When hope becomes deferred, it makes the heart sick. So what are you declaring? I mean, as believers, when we're financially in, in, in dis distress or in our bodies, we declare the word of God. Or we should anyways, declare the word of God until we receive the promise of God. We don't give up. But when it comes to the personal things that God has told us, those things that God has aligned us for to do, they're important. Some, some, somehow we just take that as a lackadaisical, you know, I'm so busy, I got all this other stuff. I'm busy. You're busy. God's busy in our business. And God wants us to be busy in his business. And one way you begin to walk in the place that God has commanded you to walk is to declare where he's called you to walk and the promise that he's given you. Too often we receive prophecies and all these great, great moments of words from God through, through different people. And we know it's God speaking to us. And then we just put it on a shelf and walk away from it. You need to keep it alive. You need to keep it active. You need to keep it before you. You need to write it down. Habakkuk tells us, write the vision down, make it plain so you can run with it. If you don't write it down, three, four months from now, you're going to forget about it. God will bring it back to you and remind you, and then you do the same thing. You forget about it. And you don't ever progress forward. And God has a plan for your life, and he has places for you to walk and things for you to do, and you're too busy doing other things. Boy, we're meddling this morning. My goodness. Let's get on to happy stuff, Pastor. Happy stuff. And so, we see then that the saints of old had tenacity to hold on to the promises of God until they became a reality in their life. And these are all ordinary people. They weren't somebody special, some highly anointed king, priest. They were ordinary people who did extraordinary things that transformed their generation and the world itself. You can be that same person. 
If you'll grab a hold of the promise that God has given you and stick with it until it comes to pass. It may not all come to pass in just one moment of a time. There may be steps to follow, but every step that you step, every forward momentum you make brings you one step closer to the plan, the purpose, and the will of And that is a lot better than sitting on the couch eating bonbons, waiting for God to do something. You know how often I've heard that? I'm just waiting for God. No, you're not. You're not. I have several words floating in my head, but I'm not going to use them. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you to get up off that couch Put the remote down, and I'm using the couch and bonbons facetiously. You understand? Maybe some of you do have bonbons by your couch next to the remote. I don't know. <laughs> or Laffy Taffy. <laughs> so we need to understand these are ordinary people that are doing extraordinary things. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36, reading from the New King James Version, says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds of imprisonment. Aren't you glad right now that's not you? But there are believers in the world that are going through this, that are sustaining themselves through their trust and ability in God. Notice the word here, others. The others had trials. It's, it's a Greek word which means others of a different kind. Up until this point, the writer of Hebrews has focused on the lives of Old Testament heroes, and he's now shifting his attention to the New Testament believers and begins to describe the price they paid to relentlessly stand by, our Greek word again, hoopostasis, the promises of God in faith. This was the price they had to pay. So when you think about your mere light afflictions of some of the things that you have to go through because you are standing in faith for the promises of God to come into your life, think about some of these men and women who are beaten, scourged, sawed asunder. So they endured cruel mocking, scourging, scourgings, and imprisonment for their faith. So the Bible says, and others had a trial... The word trial is the Greek word, and it describes an intense trial. I don't know about you, but I've gone through some things that I would consider an intense trial, but I've never been in prison. I've never been whipped, beat, scourged. So an intense trial. The phrase cruel mockings is a translation of a Greek word, which means to play a game. This word was often used for playing a game with children and for us amusing a crowd by impersonating someone in a silly and exaggerated way. We could say it might be used in the, in, like in the game of charades when someone intends to comically portray someone or even make fun of or ridicule or mock someone. So the use of this particular word lets us know that New Testament believers were often mocked and made fun of. Oh my, our church today, if somebody mocks us, we get our feelings hurt. Man, they were beaten. I just read, you know, I just read yesterday a news item, a street preacher, I forget where he, um, he was preaching on a street corner in Tempe, Arizona. Young man, Military, just preaching the word of God. Somebody drove by and shot him in the head for preaching the word of God. Society's changing, folks. What we have grew up with, the freedom we have grown up in to declare our faith and to, is changing. People hate us, not because of who we are, but be who we serve. There's a devil out there that wants to kill, to steal, and destroy you. That's his mission. That could be a great movie. To kill, steal, and destroy. So we have to know who we are in Christ. 
We have to apply the blood of Jesus Christ every day to our life through faith. And so what we see then, that the New Testament believers, what, 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 what they became the laughing stock to unbelievers and <clears throat> were humiliated regularly. Regularly. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. When we see this word scourgings in the Greek, it is a word mastix, which is borrowed from the world of torture. <clears throat> it really denotes the act of, of beating a prisoner or victim. And you see, once a person's wounds had mended, then the torturers often brought them back to the whipping post where he was, they were struck again and again. And although the blows were usually not serious enough to kill, such beatings would then keep the victim in constant pain and misery. Sounds like a Western song, right? Pain and misery. And the word then depicts a scourge that caused great suffering and prolonged anguish, torment, and abuse. All this because they were believers. All this because they wouldn't let go of the promise of God. First century Christians also endured bonds and imprisonments. The word bonds describes one that is completely bound. And the word imprisonment is a translation of the Greek word, of a Greek word which is... Um, the word for a Roman prison, which was one of the most dreadful places to ever end up in the Roman world. Yep. Many believers were locked up in Roman prisoners for their faith in Christ. I just reading another article yesterday, I do read, Tom, <laughs> were in China. The Chinese government sent police into a small Chinese church and arrested them all for preaching the gospel. You see, though, you get a hold of the gospel, you get a hold of the power of the word of God, it will transform and change a nation. It will. And, and the devil knows the authority of the power of the word, so everything he wants to do is to subjugate that authority to null. And he's scaring believers into believing that it's going to cost them something. And in fact, it may cost us something. But we have to determine which is more important, the promise of God or the promises of society. It goes on to say, Hebrews chapter 37... The writer of Hebrews continues to describe the plight of the New Testament believers. Now, this is, this is an Old Testament. New Testament is the dispensation in which we live in today. And so, the 37th verse says they were stoned. They were sawn in two. Were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Folks, we think just because we're, we're believers and we have authority that nothing is going to happen. And there is a place of walking in divine protection. But these people were also in a place of divine protection. And yet they had an opportunity to compromise their belief system to compromise their faith. You see, there will be tests and trials that may come. It may not come in the manner such as this, but it will come to test your faith. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he comes to destroy the lives of every believer. Now, we know that there are times like we had... Um, Stephen, who was stoned outside the gate 
There are times where things happen that it don't seem like God's in control or doesn't seem like that's, that's God's plan. But what does Stephen say? Forgive them, Lord. As he looked up into heaven. See, there are times where, through our suffering, it still brings glory to God. Because we haven't compromised. No matter what they do to us physically, we have not compromised. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross and he, and he let out the last breath, what did the Roman soldiers say? This man truly was the Son of God. There are moments and times that we go through suffering that brings glory to God. Not that God has brought the suffering. Don't misinterpret me, God. I'm, I'm going to send some suffering for my children so they'll learn some humility. No, God doesn't bring, God doesn't rob, doesn't steal, and doesn't bring destruction. If that's going on in your life, now, case in point, look at the life of Job. Job was a godly man. Job had things going for him. One day, Satan showed up in heaven and said, the only reason Job's got stuff going on for him is because you've got a hedge of protection around him. So that shows us that God protects his children. And then what, what did God say? Well, I'll, I'll remove the hedge of protection. When he did, what happened? All of a sudden, his cattle's destroyed, his family's destroyed, his, his uh, lands are destroyed, his body's being destroyed. It doesn't say God did it. God said he removed the hedge of protection and allowed it for a season of time. Does that mean that God moves the hedge of protection off of individuals to test them? No, that's not what we're talking about here. What I'm trying to prove to you is that there, there is a, an accuser of the brethren who stands before the father with Job. He's there to destroy your life. He's there to bring pain. He's there to bring suffering. He's there to stop you at whatever cost he can stop you from proclaiming that you're not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God under salvation. There's a cost to serving God. And so, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37 Reading from the New King James says, They were stoned, they were sawn in two, tempted, were, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about with sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. So when we see the word stone, it's, it's, it's the Greek word, the, tha, the thazado. It's a Greek word, we'll just say it at that, which means to stone. <laughs> what a way. I mean, sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Names will never hurt me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so to stone means, it, it, it means to overwhelm or bury with stones, to assail with stones with the intention to kill. Now, I, I, I mean, I've moved some big rocks before. Dropped one on my foot. It hurt. I can't imagine people throwing stones at me with the intent to kill, because they're not just like, mm. they are, they're boulder sizing it. We're not just playing with marbles and little pea gravel here. So the scripture also says that some believers then were sawn asunder, meaning it's, it, it's, they, were saw, they were sawed in two, which is a translation of the Greek word prezado, meaning to saw or to cut into two pieces, it pictures the horrible practice of sawing an individual in half. Alive. Alive. Yeah. Back then they didn't have any painkillers. Can you imagine that? Having somebody saw on you as you're alive? <laughs> Surgery's bad enough. Moreover, the Bible says believers were tempted, which is the Greek word perizado, which means to put to the test. It depicts a test to expose the truth about the quality of a substance, an intense examination or questioning or even an interrogation. And this word was used to describe the process of testing coins to determine if they were authentic or counterfeit. And... These believers had made a bold confession of faith 
And what was happening, the devil was testing them to see just how genuine their faith was. Would they hold on to the word that they received from God, or would they cast away their confidence to escape the pressure the enemy was bringing? The, the enemy brings the pressure. He brings pressure to quit, to give up, to walk away, to lay the dreams down. You see, if he could get them and you to abandon the promises of God, then their faith and your faith would not be what they claimed it to be. You'd just be another false witness. And evident, evidently, the devil wants to provide enough false witnesses that God's a liar. How does he provide false witnesses? By you giving up on the truth. By you declaring things to your family, friends, employers, and then making these great, great assertions of how big your God is, your doctors. And then they never see the end game. They never see the complete of it because you have given up and walked away. What else did the first century believers experience? The Bible says they were slain with the sword. The word slain is the Greek word phonos, phonos, which means to slaughter or to massacre. It describes the barbaric butchery and, butchery and carnage that some followers of Christ went through at the hands of ungodly men. Now, we say, well, that would never happen today. Really? Look just what happened in Gaza and Israel. The things that are coming out, that are being spoken of, that happened. I mean, I read another article. I, I mean, it's too detestable to even speak of in the, in the church what they did to their victims. The brutality, the inhumanity, the immorality, rapes, beheadings, children. We forget how divisive and evil the devil can be when he empowers men to do his bidding. The writer of Hebrews went on to say that there are also Christians who wandered in the sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. In the 37th verse, the word wandered here is a Greek word which means to wander, to roam, or to move around. They had no home. And then when we see the reference to sheepskins and goatskins, it could refer to Nero's brutal killing of, of believers. Yep. The Roman historian, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Tecitus. Tecitus? T-A-C-I-T-U-S. You figure it out. Tychicus. Yes, I'm Well, thank you. <laughs> Recorded that Nero had Christians covered in wild beast skins and then torn to death by dogs. The Bible says a number of believers were destitute, which is a translation of a Greek word. It means to be lacking, depleted, impoverished, or suffering in physical need. Still others were afflicted and tormented. Now, in the Greek, the word afflicted is a word, and it means to be pressured, compressed, or su suffocated. And the word tormented is a Greek word which means to oppress, to torment, or to maltreat. Not everything is always hunky-dory. We have it good here in America at the moment. But there are forces at work in our government that are working to make the gospel illegal. And in some places, we have nations just to the north of us that you, there's certain things you can't say that preachers would end up in prison for if they said it. They can't speak against certain sins of the Bible because it's a hated, hatred. But yet God doesn't call it hatred. He calls it sin. But if you call that sinner a certain word, then you could end up in jail for speaking the truth. You see, we're coming into a place where the truth is becoming a lie and the lie is gaining the truth. But you continue to hold on to God's word. You continue to stay steadfast in the promises of God, which are yes and amen. Amen. 
So first century believers experienced, it all, experienced all these forms of abuse and torture, yet they did not let go of the promises that God had given them. Instead, they continued to stand by the word that they had received, and they brought great glory to God. You have to determine early at what cost the, the gospel will cost you. Because there may come a point in time where it may cost you. Is the gospel worth laying your life down for? Yes. Now, I know other instances. I heard a story at one time. Missionary, so, you know, we're giving you this is what the Bible talks about, so we're giving it to you as well. But when we come back, I, I remember hearing a story of a missionary. He was in Africa someplace. And back then, when he was, when he was um, going into the unknown tribes, there were still cannibalistic tribes. What is a cannibalistic? They eat people. They consider you a delicacy. And so he, f he wound up, he wound up getting to the place where they had taken him prisoner and they were going to put him in a boiling pot. They are going to stew him alive. As he's in there praying, he knows that his time is coming. And as they go to walk out, the tribes, all the tribesmen, the chiefs and the elders, they fall to the knees. They begin to bow. When he, was, when he asked through the translator what's going on, there were two large white beings standing on each side of the missionary that were to eight to ten feet tall that these tribesmen saw. So there are times where you go through things, and the, but... Where was his faith? Where was Daniel's faith? Where was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three men in the fiery furnace, what did they do? They said, we're not going to compromise our belief system in our God. We will pay the price of death. What happened? Old King Nebuchadnezzar, he was a little upset. In fact, it says he was so upset that... The, the facial features changed. He was so angry. He told him, heat that furnace seven times. So when they went to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, the men that went to throw them into the fire were burned up. That would have been my first clue. Something's not right here because there was nothing going. They were bound. Their ropes aren't even on fire. Everybody around them is cooked. We're having barbecued centurions tonight. King Nebuchadnezzar looks down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are walking around in the fire. And he said, Lo, didn't I put three men in the fire? And they said, Oh, king, yes, you did. So then why is it I count four and one is like the Son of God? And when they came out, their clothes didn't even smell like barbecue. So there are times where you stand up in faith. There are times where you declare your faith that there's divine protection, but we're also seeing that there are times that you're going to go through some things, and in the end, it will bring glory to God just as much as you standing there and angels appearing. That's a part of the faith message that we kind of stay away from. You're going to, you may go through some things. Oh, just believe God. If you're going through some things, you must, your faith must not be all that great. Well, how about it? Yes, it is, because it's sustaining me right now. My life may be coming to an end because I will not give up my faith for what you declare to be truth. And God is sustaining me. And I'm walking through this. That's what happened to Stephen. Stephen. I mean, he, he, made the, he made the religious leaders pretty upset. They took him out and stoned him for what God showed him. The prophets of old 
Man, they were beaten and stoned because they declared the word of God and the people didn't like it. But what we're seeing here is that if we learn to live in faith, did you know you die in faith as, long as, as well as you live in faith? Hallelujah. Now, I like the promise, trust me, I like the promise with long life, will he satisfy me and show me his salvation? But there are people, they call them martyrs, that did not give up their faith for a better promise. They held on to the truth. Now, that's not to say that, you know, I'm not saying that, well, all right, I get in a car crash and I'm killed. What, what glory does that bring to God? Nothing. But there are times where you'll stand before men. You may declare things. That no matter what suffering you're going through, in the end brings glory to God. It points people to Jesus. You hold on. Not a happy message this morning, is it? All right. So the first century believers, then, they experienced all forms of abuse and torture, but they did not let go of the promises of God. Instead, they continued to stand by the word of God that they received, and it brought great glory to God. Then it goes on to say in the, 11th, in the 38th verse that it says that they wandered in deserts, mountains, dens, and caves. It says, of whom the world was not worthy. Isn't that interesting? The world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and the caves of the earth. In this verse, the, world, the, word, word, <laughs> the word world is a form of the Greek word cosmos, and it describes the world system or society during that age. So the world at that time was not worthy of the caliber of people these Christians were. The world is not worthy of the caliber of believers you are. Yet, these followers of Christ ended up wandering everywhere. And the word wandering here is a Greek word, plano, which means to wander or to roam. And the, and the first place that these persecuted believers ended up was in deserts which is the Greek word irmos, and it's pictured a, des a deserted place, a remote spot, a place out of the way, or somewhere off the beaten track. It's an obscure site. And they also wandered in the mountains, from the Greek word oros, and it describes a mountain or a hill. More than likely, it was in these deserts and mountains that believers found dens and caves in which to dwell separated from society. The word dens is a Greek word which literally describes holes in the earth, usually in remote locations, and the word caves is, the Greek, is a Greek word which describes a den, caves, caverns, or hiding places. So as the castaways from society, many Christians learn to live their lives in seclusion, separated. And what do these believers do? They obtained a good report. When we come to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, the Bible says that all these having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. The phrase obtained a good report is a Greek word material which describes a testimony in a court of law, one who is condemned by his testimony. It's a form of the Greek word martis, which is from where we get the Greek or from the, our English word martyr. And this word was predominantly used to describe either a witness who was summoned to testify in a court of law or the evidence or proof presented in a legal case. So in New Testament times, um, martis meant one could be placed in jeopardy of even losing one's life. And they faced the risk that 
other people who did not appreciate their testimony would persecute or afflict them for telling the truth. It's easier to tell a lie in today's society. Nevertheless, a faithful witness was willing to tell the truth regardless of the ramifications. Are you a faithful witness? If so, you will tell the truth of the gospel no matter what the penalty during, during you know, COVID when they were closing churches all, all over America. There were pastors that set up, you will, stood up and said, you will not close my church. There were pastors in Canada that, that, that would not allow their churches to be closed because they believed that the institution was a place of safety. Instead of using, you know, well, at the, during COVID, liquor stores were open, but churches had to be closed. Interesting, isn't it? Gentlemen's Club. Gentlemen's Club. So we took the precautions even here, you know, so people could come and feel safe. And be safe, not just feel safe, but be safe. But, th but these, these were men and women that stood up and said, you will not, you cannot stop the word of God. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. And in California, they're being sued for millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And thankfully, the Supreme Court is, you know, stepping in and saying, you know what? No, no, that's, that's that freedom of religion. So... Faithful witnesses that were willing to tell the truth regarding the ramifications. And because of that, these believers obtained a good report because they refused to let go of the promise that God had given them. What's God given you? They gave their testimony of Jesus and refused to recant their confession of faith. And the Bible says they received not the promise. This phrase received not is a form of the Greek word komerizo, which means to receive or to receive what one has coming to them. In this case, it means they did not receive what was due or what they had coming to them because God had something far better in mind. And then the writer of Hebrews wraps up the 11th chapter saying, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should be, not be made perfect. So a couple words in this passage of scripture. The word provided here is a, Greek, is a Greek word which means to see beforehand or to see in advance. So God having provided or having seen beforehand or seen in advance. The word better, which means comparatively much better, much stronger, more excellent. This means that God was able to look very far into the future and see a better, stronger, and more excellent reward for his people. Verse 40 goes on to say, you know, when Jesus went to the cross, it looked like hell had won. But God looked into the future. He looked into the future and saw a better, stronger, and more excellent reward for us by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Notice they killed Jesus. Notice they tortured Jesus. Notice that the ending hours of his life was miserable, torturistic, unhealthy for any human being. But God had a plan for him to walk through that. And then when he died, physically, spiritually, everybody thought it was over. But God saw the future. And he saw that the work that Jesus did on the cross would buy and pay for redemption for all of us for all eternity. Amen. So Jesus willingly went through that so that we could have the provision that God provided. Some things we go through is not just for us, but we're going through it so that we can provide access for people to see God's glory. 
So verse 40 goes on to say that without us should not be made perfect. This phrase without us is another Greek word is chorus meaning without as being outside of a specific place. It also can mean apart and distinct from us. So when we look at the word perfect it's the Greek it's another Greek word which means to reach the end stage to reach the final phase to reach the final conclusion or to reach the aim when we look at this verse in the in the amplified classic version verse 40 makes what is being said here through all these words very clear because God had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us so that the so that they these heroes and heroines of faith should not come to perfection apart from us before we could join them the bottom line is that these men and women of god stayed in faith despite life-threatening conditions they endured isn't that interesting Sometimes our light afflictions, the Bible says. Think about what some of these people went through just for their faith. And think about what you're having to go through. Does it compare? We're not in the comparison. But the point is, is that some of these men and women laid down their life. They were tortured. They were beaten. They were sawed asunder. They were scourged. They were whipped for their belief in God. You have to stay in faith. You see, and while they themselves did not see the manifestation of the promise they were holding on to, we are standing in the manifestation of what they believed God for. That's why it's important for us to stay in faith. Even if you don't see the manifestation of God's promises now, the next generation will. Just like Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you have to shift your faith to believe God's promise, which is going to come to pass on your children and even your grandchildren. And when life tries to take it from you, you have to set your face like flint and say, God's promise, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I have it now. Why do I have it? Because I've wrapped my spiritual jaws around it and I will never let it go. Even if I have to shift my faith to believe it's going to happen in the lives of my kids and my grandchildren. I'm not going to let go of it. I'm never going to release the word of God. I'm never going to re release the word that God gave me. I'm going to stay in my place of faith. You can do this. Do you know why you can do this? Because the Bible tells us in Philippians 4 verse 13 that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You can endure everything that comes along. You just have to grow up a little bit. You have to stand in your place. You have to stand not only in your place, but you have to stand in your armor. You have to stand believing that what God said you could have, it's yours, even when you're not going to see it in your lifetime. God gave you a promise for a generation. Some of these promises that God speaks to us, some of these things we begin, we may not see the fulfillment of it. There are families, I think about the Ford Motor Company. He had a dream and a vision to build a car. He didn't know that 19, 19, or 19, we're still in 1900s, 2023, where his company would be today. But he began with what he had. He endured all the critics and the criticisms. He, he endured the, the financial distresses that came along with it. But he never saw what we see today in automobiles. He never saw the horsepower that was available. But he had a dream. He had an idea. And he invested that dream into his children. And it could go down, we could go on in all different types of fields of labor. 
men who have started business, men and women who have started businesses that have left it. Maybe they've, they've never seen it, the fulfillment of it, to the completion of what it is today. Maybe it was the son or the daughter or the grandchild that took it from a, a, a $100,000 business to a multi-billion dollar business. But the birth the dream was still birthed on the inside of them. And the promise that God gave them was just not only for them, but was for them and their children and their children's children and to the generations. What we do today may not just be for our, me, myself, and I, but we may be establishing a work that God wants to use to reach the next generation and the next generation. I'm thinking of Billy Graham. Billy Graham began to preach when he was a boy. Kenneth Hagin, a boy. Kenneth Copeland, a young man. We could go on and on. And, and, you know, look what they, I mean, look what they're doing today. I know that Rama Bible College has got Bible colleges all over the world now, training men and women to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the authority of the believer. I know that Samaritan's Purse, man, when disasters happen, they're one of the first people, uh, you know, even, even during COVID, I was, I was just utterly shocked at our, 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 our leaders, man, when he wanted to bring hospitals and tents and beds into a particular city that, was, that, that had an outbreak of it and was coming in to help, wasn't asking anything. They were providing everything and the city turned them down because they were Christian. They were afraid that, 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 we would um, proselytize, proselytize unbelievers and force them to become Christians to get the medical services. And all they wanted to do was say, hey, we're blessed enough to be able to provide this. They go into third world nations. All this started years and years and years and years ago in the mind and the heart of a man named Billy Graham. Lester Summerall. Feed the children. God gave him this desire. I remember back in the 80s when, when he first started talking about it. Feed the children. How just, if you would just donate $6 or $8 a month, you could feed children in third world countries. And now it's, the kids and the grandkids are running. It's a multi, multi-generational ministry. But yet, it was birthed in his heart. He never saw the fulfillment of it to the, what it is today. That doesn't mean that it wasn't God's plan. And so what is God birthing in your heart? Sometimes we have things in us that we think are, are, are just too big. But you know, you may, you may just be the starting block. As we say, you're starting the engine. You may be the, only, you may be the choke on the engine just to get it running long enough for somebody to come in. and We have an individual here at the church. Her, her mother was married to a pastor. You know, and he pastored that church for many years. One day he decided, you know, it was time to turn the church over to another generation. And that generation rose up and took that church and ran with it. Just because the pastor retires doesn't mean the ministry's done. God saw and knew way before you retired what was going to happen. Just because you pastoring doesn't mean that's where you'll end up. Hallelujah. Sometimes we do things for experience to gain, to gain the wisdom and the knowledge how to comply with the plan, the will, and the purpose of God. That we can train and develop and grow the next generation through faith. God calls us to do things that are impossible in our own abilities, in our own minds, in our own thinking. Anytime God calls us, anytime there's a plan, a provision, I'm telling you right now, there's an enemy that's coming to steal it, to kill it, to destroy it. Because if he can stop you in the here and now, he can stop the plan of God in the future. Because you are the carrier of that vision. You are the carrier of that torch. You are the carrier of that fire. And if you're not careful, your fire will become just a dwindling ember 
of a coal bed that's dying. You're going to have to go in there. You're going to have to stir it up. You know, having had many fires, not in my house, but we used to do a lot of big outdoor fires and cook outdoors. And if you weren't careful and you weren't paying attention to the fire, it could begin to go out. It could get, I used to have a billow, you know, big old billow, because I got tired of blowing on the fire. <laughs> Hair dryer just always made a mess of everything. And so, but if, that, if the embers got too low, we call it fanning the flame. You could rebuild that fire from just a small ember. Some of you may have just a small ember burning of the plan of God in your life, but you can adapt, overcome. You can get the billow out. And you can begin to fan the flame of God in your life until it becomes so consuming that you can't walk away from it. You cannot quit. You will stand up for the plan. You will operate in the plan. You will walk in the plan. And you will be the plan because it's on the inside of you. Jeremiah said that, that the word of God was shut up like fire in his bones. He had to proclaim God's word, but he could not. You need to fan the flame of God in your life until it consumes you again. Like when Jesus came into your life, man, there was nothing you wouldn't do for Jesus. But over a process of time, you know, that, that, that first love, that fire begins to dwindle. If you don't keep that fan on that fire, it's going to go out. And the other thing is, if you don't feed the fire fuel, it's got nothing to burn. If you don't feed the vision of God in your life, I'm telling you, it's going to go out. It will not continue to burn on its own. How do you fan the flame? How do you... you we go back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter 2. That's in the Old Testament. Where? Well, that's a different story. Habakkuk. It's one of the minor prophets. Huh? Fifth book from the end. If you, have a, if you have a Bible like mine, we're on page 1161. Oh, no, I have it right here. Habakkuk chapter 2. This is the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon that city. Is it 2? I'm sorry? Yep. Oh, I'm in chapter 3. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder it don't make sense, Tom. You ever done something like that? Never. Never. All right. Verse two, chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and sit upon the tower. Now, these are military terms. And I will watch to see what he'll say unto me, and I will answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Isn't that amazing? He didn't say, speak the vision. He said, write the vision. Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables. Tables were, is a writing pad. So that he may run with the vision that reads it. He may run with the vision that reads it. For the vision, notice this, is, not, is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and it not lie. It will tarry. Wait for it because it will surely come to pass. So we are to write the vision down. Then we are to do what? Write the vision and make it plain. You got to write it so you can understand it. 
It's like writing a business plan. If you write a business plan with all these big words you don't understand, you're not going to know how to implement it. You have to write the vision down enough, simple enough, so that you can understand it. And so, I want to read you something because it's important. I want to read you this statement. What you think on is what you're going to believe. If you think that the vision of God, the plan of God, will never come to pass in your life, you're right. It won't. Because you're not feeding it fuel to bring that to pass. So what you think on is what you'll believe. What you believe is what you'll speak. You can tell what you're believing by what you're speaking. Many people, I hear this, oh, I'm such a loser. I'm such a failure. They believe that, so they speak it. And what you speak is the life that you're going to live. What are you speaking today? What are you declaring today? Are you declaring the plan, the vision of God in your life to be yes and amen? Are you planning on, uh, on God's uh, on God fulfilling what he told you? Or are you just kind of hanging out, hoping that it'll all come to pass at some point, some place, somewhere, that God's big enough to do something for you? God gave you a word. Now speak that word. Speak in faith until it becomes a reality. Step out. Don't sit. Step. Faith, you know, faith is work. I don't care what they say. It's not just sitting around laziness. It's work. Step out. Do what God told you to do. He's waiting on you. He's not, you're not waiting on him. Oh, we just get over here and this all be. No, he's waiting on you. Most of the people, most of the people that are doing something for God are doing something because they've taken that promise and began to act on it. Now, there are times where the vision, you know, there's always a step. The first step to any vision is to begin to declare it. You need to be able to see it clearly, and by declaring it, you're speaking what you believe. As it begins to formulate, write it down. Write it down so you may not understand everything. I, this stuff I wrote down 25 years ago it didn't make any sense to me. But you know what? Today, we're walking in some of those things. Pastor Kim and I have been talking about some of these things for 20 years. 20 years we've been speaking it. But it's an appointed time. The resources weren't available. The technology wasn't available. But God saw in advance and he put it in our heart and to, to declare it. So as we declare it, we speak it, we believe it, we walk it. And when people say you can't do it, when people come against you for standing up to the promises of God. Oh, God has a plan for your life that's far greater than any plan you could even think of for your life. But you have to get in agreement with God. You have to quit saying, I'm a loser. You have to quit saying, well, I'm not worthy. God made you worthy when his son Jesus Christ went to that cross and died. He anointed you, appointed you, and redeemed you. You are worthy. There are giftings on the inside of you that are laying dormant because you're not doing anything with them that God wants to instill, stir up, fire up, rekindle up because he has a plan for your life. It's not over. You're not done. It's not coming to an end. You're just beginning. You need to step out. As doors open, don't spend time praying for them. Take them. Now, there's things we have to pray for. I understand that. But there, when, you, when God says, this is the direction we're going, and you say, okay, and the opportunity comes, ah, oh, let me pray about that. Heck no, I'm, I'm, I'm going full steam. It's like saying, Tom's going to give me $100,000. Well, let me pray about that, Tom. I don't know if I'm going to receive that yet, but let me just make sure the timing's right. Heck no. State comes along, because we want to give you a million dollars. Say, ah, oh, let me pray about that. I just want to make sure the timing's right. No, it's an opportunity. I grasp it. Trust me. I've been praying for Tom for a while. <laughs> Amen. Did you get anything out of this morning? Yeah. Grab the opportunity. Seize the opportunity in faith. 
and then run with it, and you won't be disappointed. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that the entrance of your word has brought and given life and light. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you that in Jesus Christ is life, he's truth, and your word says that he said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to know you except through him. This morning, Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice, Holy Spirit, I ask you to convict them of their unrighteousness and their need of a Savior. You may be watching this morning, and I know everybody here and so, but, uh, is born again, but you may be watching this morning, and maybe you've never had the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The scripture we just read was John 14 and verse 16. Romans tells us how we can receive Jesus. It says that we'll confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God, that Jesus was raised from the, that God raised Jesus from the dead, we would be saved. We would be made whole. The Bible tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, will be restored, redeemed, delivered. It doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter where you're at, doesn't matter what you've done. There's forgiveness in the blood. Sure, there's consequences maybe in the natural, but spiritually speaking, there's forgiveness. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again, and I'm on my way to heaven. Man, just as simple as that, if you prayed that prayer this morning, something miraculous and wonderful is happening to you right now. That's Jesus coming in to live in your heart. I encourage you to do two things. Check out our website at www.hgc.church. Uh, under resources, you'll find our digital resources that we have made available. There's a lot of learning material out there, but most importantly, the very first one on the page is um, the new birth. Pastor Kim and I taught that. It's about five to seven minutes long per video and about 10 videos each. And so the next thing I encourage you to do is find yourself a good Bible-believing church, man. If you're in the San Antonio area, we believe His Grace Church is such a place as that. And you can find our location address on your screen now, I believe. It should be at 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway. Parkway. Where is that located? Well, we're conveniently located in the far west part of San Antonio uh, in the 410-151 corridor inside the Loop 410 just off of Claiborne, uh, not far from Colliani, Harley-Davidson, and Ingram Park Mall. Pastor Kim and I want to remind you that for us here in the United States, it is Thanksgiving on Thursday. We believe that times such as this should not be regulated to having to get to church and so that you spend this time with your family and enjoy uh, that aspect of what God has provided for you through your family. So there will be no service. Amplify is postponed until next week. And so Amplify is where we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living is our midweek Bible study. I encourage you to check out our uh, social media platforms. If you haven't done so, we're on Facebook, Twitter, which is our now X, um, YouTube, and we are also on Rumble. Follow us, like us, subscribe to us, be a part of the family. You'll find that there's a lot of many helpful uh, tools and resources that we put out there to help develop and grow you spiritually. And so we look forward to serving you in that manner. I cover everything. Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where miracles still happen today. God bless you. I'll see you right back here next Sunday. Have a great week.